Welcome everybody. This is Christina Inrig here and I'm thrilled to be co-hosting with Sam the uh, Capacity Building Certificate Program. Of course, you're all used to Sam being the host of the series, but because she is the star of the show today, mm -hmm. I offered to uh, to do the uh, welcome and intro um, today. So we're just giving it a moment for everyone to join in. It's a really exciting topic on boards and fundraising today. It's always exciting when Sam is here to talk about fundraising and money. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm thrilled that we're going to hear more on this topic. Um, but before we do, we're going to hear a little bit about the Capacity Building Institute. And uh, I'm not sure how many people were registered today. Uh, Hannah, maybe you can uh, let me know if we should be good to go for, for that. Uh, but please go ahead and enter in the chat sort of who you are and where you're calling from. Um, we'd love to sort of see who's in the room here, so to speak. We also want to give a huge shout out to the participants of the Capacity Building Certificate Program. We have a number of people uh, that are part of our CBCP program, which runs from June to December. It's a boot camp on how to run a small shop nonprofit organization in the environmental sector. And those um, participants of the CBCP are also taking part in these webinars every month uh, to learn about a topic. And it follows the same topic that we cover. Um, so let's uh, let's kick it off by going over to hear from Natushka uh, about the Capacity Building Institute. So welcome, Natushka. Thank you very much, Christina. Welcome everyone, good afternoon. So my name is Natushka Michelle Flay. I am the outreach coordinator for uh, Capacity Building CBI uh, Institute. Uh, let me talk to you about uh, CBI. So CBI stands for Capacity Building Institute, uh, provides training, coaching, marketing, um, mentorship, support to staff and volunteers in the environmental nonprofit sector across Canada. We aim to foster leadership within the environmental sector, like I said, provide training, coaching, mentorship at all stage from executive director to board member, fundraiser, and other staff. We, our mission is to train 10,000 leaders of small shop nonprofit environmental organization all around Canada in the next 10 years. We believe that Canada environmental deserve all the help he can get uh, from well-run nonprofit organization, from donors, from well-trained staff and board member, that environmental nonprofits plays a vital role in the ongoing effort to insert a healthy and sustainable future of all Canadian. We believe that training matters. It helps keep our organization well-staffed, fully compliant with laws and regulation and effective in their game-changing work. We also believe that small shop organization makes a big difference. They had diversity, dynamics, growth root involvement in Canada environmental sector. And last, we believe that there is much more to do in a strong and more resilient environmental sector uh, is within our reach. And we have, if we have the encouragement, the, 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 the courage and the commitment to build it all together. What do we offer? CBI offered the CBCP certificate program, which we just joined. We are at the second month uh, today, July. He had started in June. Now we are, we just did uh, before that, the July one. Uh, we offer enter, internship training program, fundraising intensive workshop, capacity building webinar series, which we're right now again, uh, leadership training streams. So it is six core models that we're going to go through the CBCP uh, program. Uh, and today we uh, did the, the second governments and board development and which Sam will talk more about it later on. We even have testimony from, uh, we have one here from Dominic Suhi, who uh, did the program and really enjoyed it. We have great leaders, really trainers and leaders. We have Sam Lepret, who's gonna be talking today. Uh, we have Rob Burns, we have Barb King, and we have Alex. So today's sponsors, we have Eco Internship. So Eco Internship supports uh, grassroots environmental nonprofit organization 
uh, in providing practical work experiences and leadership uh, opportunities for youth aged from 18 to 30, which are, we, we're running right now the program. Some have started last week and some have started today. Um, through their intern support program, uh, Eco Internship helps develop sustainable solution to hire youth interns. They will walk you through the old process from start to finish and provide the necessary resources to have a successful internship experience. To date, um, ECO Internship has helped secure over 170 internships and has provided over 60 organizations with human resources support. So if you want to have more information, the one who's responsible for that is uh, Anna. Uh, Rockburn, who's with us today. For more information, uh, you could text at info uh, echo internship .ca. Our team, so we have Anna, like I just said, uh, Rockburn, uh, who's the operation manager, and or me, Natushka Michelle Flay, who's the outreach coordinator. So you could contact us rather by email at infocapacitybuilding.ca. Uh, you could visit our website, uh, capacitybuilding.ca, uh, or you could come, I will say, visit us. We'll be happy to see you or um, uh, send a letter to the address who's there. Don't forget to save the date. The next webinar will be August 14th at 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, the subject will be volunteering, volunteer engagement and human resource. Thank you very much. Back to you, Christina. Great. Thank you so much, Natushka. We really appreciate you and Hannah and everything you guys are doing to help uh, keep CBI moving forward with these great webinars. Uh, and, uh, and that's really um, the next step is to hear about boards and governance. Uh, of course, Sam LaPrade is our normal host of these sessions and is a wonderful leader when it comes to talking about anything to do with fundraising. But as mentioned, because today we're talking more about boards and and how to really engage your board. And um, we've thought, what, what better topic than to focus on fundraising? So welcome, Sam. I don't think you need much more of an introduction because you've been <laughs> with us so many times, but really looking forward to hearing the content that you have to share today. And as always, welcome. Thank you so much. I, I love coming here. It's, uh, it's a highlight every single month. Um, I wanted to, uh, to share uh, some information with you today and, and hopefully will uh, help inspire some of those board members uh, to help you fundraise, I want to talk to you a little bit about this picture. So this picture is from 1979. And yes, that's me dressed up as Olivia Newton-John, because of course it was the grease days, and my little buddy Fred, who was clearly about, an, you know, we're the same age, but he was a foot shorter than me. If you look closely, the little box around my neck there, of course, is that UNICEF box. And when I think about fundraising, I always joke that, you know, I would have been fundraising in the womb, but the prospects were low. Um, I was born to be a fundraiser. Some people have a lot of, um, you know, a lot of uh, excitement around fundraising. Some people are a little bit more apprehensive, but they want to get involved. So this is for, for everybody, whether you, you wore that UNICEF box around your neck or maybe you were just looking for the candy, a little bit shy to ask at the door. It doesn't really matter. You know, fundraising, um, it takes a team. Fundraising is a team sport. I say that all the time. So hopefully today we can inspire you to, to bring your board team along with you and, uh, and help you. We're all going to get on the same page in terms of fundraising. I hope that works for everybody. I'm going to start us off with a little bit of information. You've heard lots about me. I've been around since, uh, you know, a long time, since Jesus was a choir boy. So uh, a little bit about me, I have my radio show, of course, and speaker on philanthropy and write on philanthropy, uh, very passionate about this work. So today we're going to talk a little fundraising, a little stewardship, a little culture, because they all go hand in hand. You can't sort of have one without the other. And some people say to me, Sam, what is stewardship? And I always like to define it as it was defined for me, which is stewardship is the next step to the to the next gift. So it's, you know, you think back to when your grandma might have put $5 or $10 in a birthday card, you know, your mom sat you down and said, you got to write her a thank you note. Well, very similar to fundraising. It's that stewardship. It's that opportunity to ensure grandma doesn't forget about you next year and your donors don't forget about you next year. But none of this really works if you don't have that base, that foundation for the culture of philanthropy. 
And very often it starts with your board. I mean, it, it just does. Um, and so, so some of this is really important. We're going to talk about uh, a couple of different things today, but I went and saw a speaker. His name was Gerald Panis, P-A-N-A-S. And Gerald Panis has now passed away. When I say I've raised millions of dollars, Gerald Panis said he, and he did, raise billions of dollars with a B. I mean, he had the phone number for the head of McDonald's on speed dial. He had all these big corporations and could raise lots and lots of money from them. He's written lots of different books, but I remember training with him for five solid days in California in 2009. And the very first thing he did was he asked us to pull out a piece of paper and he asked us to write these two questions down. And at the time I was working for the Ottawa Mission, it doesn't really matter where you're working, but if you ask yourself these two questions, are you changing lives and are you saving lives? It can be human lives, it can be the environment, it can be, um, you know, if you're working in animal rescue, it doesn't really matter. Are you changing lives and you're saving lives? And he said to me, what I want you to do is I want you to take this piece of paper and pin it up where you're going to see it every single day when you're fundraising. Because when you ask yourself these two questions on a regular basis, it can really help guide your fundraising. And it did for me. So I'm going to ask you all to do the same thing um, in terms of Gerald's legacy. We'll keep the legacy alive. And you can sort of think about, are you changing lives and are you saving lives? Because often uh, we get so wrapped up in our mission statement, our value statement, and what does the letter look like? And okay, it's it's giving Tuesday and should I be doing something? No, the, the bottom line is, if you weren't looking through your work through these lenses, the, the actual core of what you're doing will get lost. So, and really try to encourage your board. This is a great question to ask at board meetings, by the way. So let's talk a little bit about the donor pyramid. I don't know what's older, these pyramids or the pyramids in Egypt, but the donor pyramid uh, just kind of puts us all on the same page. So we think about that geographical area. So if you're an organization that is working in Ottawa, um, you know, I think about I don't know if she's on the call today, but we think about someone like Vicki DeMillo is working for CPAWS, you know, that's a national organization. And we think about someone like Sandra Sawyers is working for um, the Ottawa Valley uh, Wild, Bo Wild Bird Care Center. You know, you can see the completely differences there, right? You're seeing a smaller footprint for someone like Sandra, Vicki being across the country. And then, of course, you think about events and you think about what happened with events in 2020. People that were relying on those events revenue uh, we're really left in the lurch. Um, so we really have to kind of rethink events and rethink those the way that we do those a little bit. The direct mail, that annual appeal, it could be that online appeal as well. We think about those monthly donors. And uh, I'll never forget a call I received about June of 2020. One of my clients that I'd worked with a couple of years before phoned me and just said, we had to reach out to you to say thank you for pushing us to do a monthly giving program. We don't know what we would do today if we didn't have that monthly giving program. So um, because, of course, the money just kept coming in through the pandemic and uh, it was a really important initiative for them. So if you don't have a monthly donor uh, program, something seriously to take a look at, we can talk more about that. Of course, those major gifts and whatever you define a major gift at, some people say $1,000, some say 10000 big giant organizations might say 100000 I'd like to think about a major gift as whatever the donor thinks a major gift is. Um, sometimes you'll have a donor give you $500 and it's a sacrificial gift and they really, you know, worked hard for it. And sometimes you see people that have given you um, $50,000 and, or even $5,000 and they don't really notice it as much. So we've got grants off to the side here. And for anyone that's ever written a grant, you know how difficult they can be um, to get. And sometimes, you know, you're about a 30% response rate is, is, is deemed successful. So it's a lot of work that goes into those grants and anyone that does that work, I have a lot of compassion for. And then of course, capital campaign over here to the left. That's if you're buying a new piece of equipment, buying a new building, a very, very different way of fundraising. Right at the top here, we have planned giving. Legacy giving, sometimes referred to as legacy giving. And this is where someone's leaving a gift in their will to you. Uh, this is a really important piece. A lot of boards don't have the patience for plan giving, but boy, if you can get them to, to see into the future and uh, invest some money into plan giving, it really is quite 
um, quite impactful. And, you know, I'll give you a bit of an example from my own life. I'm going to tell all my secrets today. Um, I collect husbands. So the reason I'm telling you that is because um, I've changed my will five times. I'm only 52 years old. So I got a will when I had that beautiful baby girl. Um, I wanted to felt really adult and needed to get that will um, as a, a new mom. And then I got divorced. So I got a new will, I got married again. So guess what? A new will. Um, and then I got divorced again. So I had to get a new will. So you get the idea. I've put uh, my lawyer's children through university. Um, but anyway, all to say is the reason I'm sharing my own personal um, story with you today is because just like me, your donors have those milestones in their life. A lot of people get a new will when they have grandchildren. Um, so when someone says you're in the will, it certainly doesn't mean you're in there forever. Who was in my will when I had my daughter and who's in my will today? Only one organization has survived that. I didn't get stewarded once I said that I was in the will or they were in the will. I never really heard back from those organizations. So it's really an, um, an interesting to keep the relationship fresh. So plan giving is a completely different way, very important way to fundraise. The average gift in this country is about $45,000, very significant. Um, and so something to think about in terms of plan giving and really try and inspire your your very own board members to get uh, with that as well. Inspiring as well to know that individuals upwards of 87%, you can see the other categories, a lot smaller giving in Canada is very important. Uh, it is all about relationships. It's all about um, the monotonous work and, and very rewarding work of dealing with donors on a regular basis. Um, but it's something that is, uh, is quite important to, uh, to sort of work with uh work with donors on a regular basis and continue to steward them. And this is, once again, put the relationship lens, this is on the relationships of your board members as well. So getting them to a point where they feel comfortable with fundraising, and not everybody's going to want to ask, and that's okay. There's lots of roles for them, so no worries there. And we want to take your organization from transactions to relationships. You don't want someone to have donor remorse, or you don't want someone to feel that when they've given you a gift, it was just as exciting as getting an oil change. You want people to feel that, that joy. We want joyful giving and joyful receiving. Uh, so we want to take that from transactions to relationships. And I mean, if there's anything you take away today, take away this fundraising, the right person asking the right prospect at the right time for the right project, for the right amount, with the right amount of stewardship. Why is this really important? Well, if I ask somebody today for $100, they probably won't go through this list, right, in their minds, but they will check a couple of boxes off. Do I trust you? Do I understand the work? Am I compassionate about your work? So it'll tick a lot of boxes for people. But if you think about sort of globally fundraising, why this is so important, because it is right here about relationships, the right person asking the right prospect, right? And this can be something as simple as the signatory on an annual um, annual appeal, um, the time that you're doing that kind of thing, really important. What are you raising the money for? What's that case for support look like? How much are you asking me for? right? And the right amount of stewardship. We're going to walk through this in a little bit more detail in a minute. But 80% of your funds typically come from 20% of your donors. What does that mean? It actually means you're probably very vulnerable, like a lot of organizations. I do a lot of donor data uh, analytics for organizations. And what I know about um, doing those analytics is sometimes people are raising even a million dollars a year and they realize that 80% of those funds are coming from 20% of those people. And boy, oh boy, if, if a lot of those people went away, so would the funds. So it's stewarding those donors, bringing people up, trying to elevate some of the other gifts, working on that mid-level as well. So it's a really important uh, opportunity to, to take a, a look and, and analyze that. Why do you want to do that? Because you want to share that with your board as well. So there's the board right there. So they're smack dab in the middle. We need them uh, on side. We need them to also be giving. And this doesn't mean it has to be a sacrificial gift from a board's perspective. Even if everybody, 100% of the board was giving a monthly gift at a, at a gift level that was um, meaningful to them. So somebody maybe that um, 
you know, is, is not uh, sort of lucrative in terms of money. They may be offered to give $5 a month. Someone else might be giving 100 and someone else might be giving 200 um, but lots of different range there, right, to give on a monthly basis. But if, if everybody's giving, it really adds to that culture of philanthropy. And we know, of course, staff and families, volunteers, suppliers, friends, and there is the community way out there. I would say probably once a week, I get somebody that finds out that I'm in fundraising and they phone me and they're like, we want to raise money from the community. And a lot of boards will put that pressure on you. Well, just go raise money from the community. I think there's a sense that people think that there's this big giant subdivision with people with big giant checkbooks that are just waiting to get the asks it doesn't exist. I would have found it by now. Uh, so uh, I think it's really important to kind of know that you have to have a lot of things in place um, before you can sort of inspire the community as a whole. Creating this, this juxtaposition, creating this opportunity to acquire new donors and cultivate those current donors. This is the juggling that every fundraiser goes through on a daily basis. You want to acquire those new donors and it can look really shiny over here and you're looking for those new donors, except you look back here and you've acquired, let's say, or you're cultivating, uh, let's say 200 donors over here. And you look over and you think, oh my gosh, the lapsing of this group is 75%. We're only keeping 25% of them. And my message always, and I've gotten more blunt about this over the years, but don't acquire a donor that you don't plan on keeping, right? You don't want to acquire a donor that you are going to see on a lapse list someday. So really, if you're going to acquire them, make sure you have the tools, the resources to be able to cultivate those donors. And we've got lots of stewardship uh, tips as well that we can share. Okay, it's that kind of day. Everybody probably needs a little bit of a sugar kick this time of uh, the afternoon. This is our big, beautiful cake. And for those that have been with me before and have seen the big cake, you can uh, sort of know where we're going here. I, I was trying to think of a way to one day, a long, long time ago, to try and explain to a client why all of these um, different documents on this uh, slide are so important. And I started describing it as a birthday cake. I said, well, you've got your strategic plan, you've got your case for support, your fundraising plan, stewardship and communications. I said, you wouldn't, you know, take all those and eat that cake one layer at a time. You would take a nice, big, beautiful slice. And why that's really important is because all of you have a strategic plan, I'm assuming. And if you don't, that's okay, you'll get there. Once you have this strategic plan, and you create your case for support, and you have your fundraising plan, and a stewardship plan, and a communications plan. And if you don't have all of them today, that's okay. Okay, don't be discouraged. There was days I didn't have them all either. But they should all be influencing each other. So often I go into so many of my clients, and what's happened is the strategic plan lives on someone's desk, the case for support lives on somebody else's. And when you really analyze those two documents, they're not actually supporting each other. And then you add a fundraising plan on top, which in the strategic plan, you don't have the tools to support the fundraising plan. So I really encourage you to kind of even take a picture of this slide, if you will, and try and think about your particular organization and, and maybe go to a few of your team members, or if you're working by yourself, you can hang out tonight and say like, how do all these things kind of interwork? And you'll see, especially from your board's perspective, how important it is that they all work together. Um, the one that's typically missing that I see in organizations is the stewardship one. I'm going to give you a little bit of a tip. This is the one that's the most fun to organize. <laughs> this is the one that's the most fun. So if you have the others, or if you have two or three on this sheet or none at all, uh, encourage you to sort of think about it this way. And then of course, you really have to have a money mindset. And what I mean by that is knowing that money means different things to different people. There are people, and I'm sure you know them in your world too, that if they had a million dollars, they wouldn't give you a thousand but yet you know people that would give you their last thousand dollars. So everybody has a different perspective and a lot of it comes from, there's lots of psychology around money, but a lot of it comes from our, our childhoods and, and how our parents perceived money. 
And uh, you can see a lot of, once again, you could do hours and hours of research into the money side of it. But remember, your board members as well have a different way of, of looking at money. You might have board member A that says, oh my gosh, happy to give you my you know $1,000 gift this year. And you might have another board member uh, who says, um, I sit on the board, that's what I do. I give time and talent, I'm not gonna give treasure. Um, so think about the money mindset um, and have open conversations. The best thing you can do. Uh, sometimes it's easier to bring somebody else in. I'll be honest, this is something I do about 20 or 30 times a year. Yeah, I just did it twice last week, go in and work with boards on their money mindsets um, because a lot of boards um, certainly have a very different sort of way of, of thinking about money. So the 11 questions donors ask, I'm going to suggest, you know, if you have a few bucks, this isn't a very expensive book. All of his uh, book revenue goes back to charity. Harvey McKinnon, uh, sort of a guru of monthly giving, wrote this book, 11 Questions Every Donors Ask. We're going to go through it really quickly today. But donors, and they may not sort of consciously ask these questions once again, but, you know, they want to know why me. They want to know, you know, why, why are you asking me? And then why are you asking me? You being the operative board, do we have a relationship? What's our context? And this is where your board members are going to come in really handy because they will have lots of relationships in the community. And even if they only have a couple of relationships and they can nurture them, um, then it's going to be really important because once again, fundraising is a team sport. We're not meant to do this in isolation. Do I respect you? You know, have you had any scandals? Are you in the news in a negative way? Do I do I like what you do? Am I respecting? Do I my values align? How much do you want? You know, I tell the story all the time about I worked very, very early in my career. I thought asking somebody for $25,000 was a lot of money, and it is. Do not make any mistake about it. I uh, was a very young fundraiser, and when I went to go see this gentleman, he wrote me a very quick $25,000 check, and as I was walking away, he said, phew, I thought you were going to ask me for $250,000. And I know he, as I learned later, had much more capacity, but I walked away with a $25,000 gift. And uh, and it's really important to do your, do your homework there. It was a big, big lesson for this young fundraiser. Why your organization? What's your unique proposition? What are you doing? What's unique from, from the, you know, the climate change organization down the street? What are you doing different? Are you measuring things? Are you engaged? Who are your, who's your leaders? You know, all of those pieces. Will my gift make a difference? This is the one that's sometimes the hardest for us to answer um, because you want to be able to show those metrics, um, but you want to make sure nobody wants to give to a big black hole, right? So you want to make sure um, that you've, uh, that you're able to, to answer that question. And is there an urgent reason to give? This will be the hardest one for you to sort of create an urgency, although the climate is a very big emergency. Um, but in terms of doing this, I've used different strategies like, you know, saying, get your gift in by this date and we ac can accomplish X, Y, and Z. Of course, it all has to be true. Um, but just uh, the urgency is really important. Is it easy to give? I can't even tell you how many websites when I start working with a new client, I go to their website and it is tedious to give a gift. It's painful. Um, so make sure it's easy to give. Um, how will I be treated? What's that? What's that like in terms of uh, if I phone and lost my tax receipt, am I going to get a, a positive response? Um, will I have a say over how my gift was used? Some people want to direct your mission through their gift. That's a no-no. Um, so uh, that's really important. And how will you measure results? And that's we spoke about that a little bit. Really, really important. This book is uh, is very, very good if you want to pick up a copy, selling it everywhere. Um, it's an important gift or important uh, uh, book for you to read. The culture of philanthropy. So the culture of philanthropy, obviously organizational values, practices that support the nonprofit organization. This is a really a key piece of any organization. So you can have all the donors in the world asking all those questions, but unless you have that culture, it's really difficult uh, to inspire them. Because culture, in the end, we know, eat strategy for breakfast. So we could have that big, beautiful cake, have the best plans in the world. But if you have a board chair or people on your board that aren't interested in fundraising, 
or they're always, you know, kind of poo-pooing every idea or not able to take risks or not participating in any stewardship, it can really make it difficult for fundraisers. This is probably the biggest complaint that I hear from fundraisers across the board. So we talked a little bit about time, talent, and treasure for your board members. We love to kind of position it this way, the trifecta of fundraising and philanthropy. Um, some people, of course, on your board giving time, uh, most people giving time and talent. And of course, we hope everybody is giving time, talent, and treasure. Uh, it kind of rounds out your board quite nicely. So an important piece there. And you really want to build trust with the community and, and really deliver on those promises uh, to the beneficiary group. You want to use the funds properly, that quality donor relations. You want to make sure those tax receipts get out nice and quickly. And of course, you want that ethical behavior. But so much of this, once again, you could be working 25 hours a day. But if your board isn't have that culture and allow you the opportunities to, to do this, it can be really challenging. So we know that every fundraiser wants every board member and volunteer to know the following. We're going to go through a really quick list here because I know we've got uh, lots uh, still to go. Uh, so basically, I developed this list after speaking to a number of fundraisers. So you might see yourself here. Uh, they need you. So we as fundraisers, we need board members. We need you there. We need you to be engaged. We also uh, need the right team. We, you know, sometimes it's, if we, we need a new resource or we need um, something, we need to um, have people surrounding us, maybe it's a consultant or we need the right team around us to do that work. And sometimes board members are, are holding those purse strings a little bit too tight and we can't sort of get at the dollars we need. They need the right tools. We don't need an old jalopy. Uh, you know, we can't work on a Commodore 64 anymore. We need the, the right tools. And we saw definitely the inequities uh, across a number of nonprofits when the when the pandemic hit, because so many organizations didn't have what it took to be able to transition to, to working from home. So we need the right tools. Uh, they need you to open doors. There's no two ways about it. As a fundraiser, we need you to open some doors for us. Um, we need you to see the big picture, that plan giving, that, that long-term donor value. If a donor gives you $50 today, and that donor gives another $50 next week, and maybe two years from now and three years from now and so on and so forth, now that donor's worth a lot more, maybe $750, right? So we know that the value is there and maybe that donor becomes a planned giving donor and there you're receiving a $50,000 gift. So seeing the big picture and looking at that long-term donor value is really important. We want to, and we do value your time as board members, uh, fundraisers, really try to make it easy, but you have to also make it a little bit easy on us. We want to make sure um, that, you know, if we're preparing those board packages and all of that, that they're respected and reviewed. Uh, we need you to give. Fundraisers need board members to give. We've talked about it a few times. They want you to tell your story. I, I love it when a board member says, do you know why I'm on this board? And I've convinced a couple of my clients to, as opposed to giving a big giant summary of of their board members' careers and everything else, all they have is a simple why story. I'm a board member at ABC organization because I really believe in climate change. I want my children um, to, to have children that are gonna be able to breathe clean air and enjoy the parks and mm -hmm. you know that type of thing. So, so do the why, even two or three lines of a why for your board members on your website is much more appealing than their big giant resume. You can find their resume anywhere. Um, but if you share their why, it's really impactful. They need you to celebrate. Oh my heavens, uh, please celebrate. When we say to you that we received a, you know, a $10,000 grant, people have no idea how much went into that. So just pause at a board meeting and just celebrate that. Um, celebrate things like reactivation. You might have brought back a couple of new donors. So, so really encourage your, your board members to celebrate. And every board member wants us to know stuff too. So let's find out what that list is. Uh, they want to help. So board members are there to help. They, they want to be part of your organization. They value you. They value us as fundraisers. Uh, they want to be informed. There's no two ways about it. You know, that's a really important piece. They want to know what's going on. They want training. I can't tell you how many times I do board training and, you know, time and time again, uh, board members will reach out to me and say, 
oh, you know, I was a bit too shy that I didn't know how to ask for a gift. We assume if somebody's the CEO of a company or, or somebody that's got a leadership position that they know this stuff. They don't, and that not everybody does. And so it's important to offer them that. They want to plan. You know, typically people that are on boards, they're doers. They want to know where are we going? What's the plan? They're nervous. There's no two ways about it, especially in the economy. We know the key interest rate probably on Wednesday will go up another quarter of a point. People are nervous about, uh, about fundraising. They're nervous about maybe asking people uh, within their circle. Um, so we have to honor that. You know, they're, they're nervous. Uh, they want to ask questions. And I always say nose in, hands out. Right. So no is in asking some of those great questions, but they're not in there to sort of muddle around. They're not in there to to do operational. They're they're typically governance boards. They want to measure results. You also want to measure results. So that's positive. Uh, they don't like surprises. I don't think anybody in the business world or in the nonprofit world likes surprises. Um, so this is a really important one as well. They don't like jargon. And I remember sitting at a board meeting once. Uh, new board that I was sitting on. And honestly, it felt like they were speaking another language. I had no clue what they were talking about. So when you're at the board meetings as staff and, and uh, as people working the front line, it's really important to either create a little bit of a legend, if you're going to be using a lot of acronyms, um, or, uh, you know, just share the, the words out. Um, so the, one of these might resonate more for you if you're a board member or you're a staff member one of these might have resonated more for you. So think about, think about that for your own uh, sort of uh, development. And we think a little bit about stewardship as well. And we think how important it is for board members to be involved. And whenever anybody asks me about getting boards involved, I always say, if we can accomplish these four things, these four things in terms of um, uh, working with your boards and having them involved in any stewardship. And for, for us as staff as well, you want to make sure you thank the donor. This could be through a letter. This could be through a phone call, an email, however you're doing that. Thank the donor to show accountability as well, um, to show how those monies that they've given were used, but also showing vision. What, what are we going to do in the future? And why do I need future money? We can wrap all that up into stewardship. Number four, in my opinion, uh, is, the, um, is the most important one. And of course, that is listening to the donor and showing the opportunity for the donor to have kind of a, a, a say. I do an exercise with a lot of boards called the menu exercise. We don't really have a lot of time to get into it today because I know we've got some questions, but uh, the menu exercise is an opportunity. A lot. I didn't develop this. Very, very smart. Other people developed it. Um, but it's basically an opportunity to sit down with your board and ask them to categorize all the different ways that they could help. And we get them to put them into three categories, appetizer, main, and dessert. And then everybody picks their own menu. So you might have 20 things on the list. Uh, board member A might pick, you know, A, B, and C. Board member two might pick, you know, something else. But everybody comes up with their what their comfort level is. And some of the ideas might be, oh, I'll phone 10 donors every quarter. Um, some might be that I'll buy tickets or I'll become a legacy donor or a monthly donor or I'll open doors or I'll create a video. There's lots of different ways that, that board members can get involved. And then this menu exercise really can kind of keep people accountable. There's some ideas for the appetizer. There's some ideas for the main, which will obviously be a bit more of a chunkier thing to do. Um, and then, of course, a dessert, making, you know, different calls to people. Um, and then you would create lots of different ideas. And what's nice about it, once you've created this menu, um, is that uh, that becomes something that you'd kind of address every board meeting and ask people how their menu's coming and have they checked any of those menu items off. And it allows people to share a lot of their ideas as well. I'm happy to take any questions. I see one here in the Q&A. Uh, is there a definition of what all these plans are? What specifically is a stewardship plan versus communications plan? Chad, I love this question. So, so when we think about, um, if we think about strategic planning, um, we think about, you know, what you're going to be doing and what your plans are for, let's say, five years. Uh, we think about that case or support you know, why are you doing this? If, if your case for support was left on a park bench, could someone pick it up and be inspired? Um, is it something um, that, you know, is, is uh, it could be a one pager, it could be a two pager. 
And then the fundraising plan is, okay, you know, we have 150 donors today. By December 31st, we want 185 donors, whatever the number is. How are we going to get there? So we're going to do X, Y, and Z fundraising plan. For stewardship plan, it's if a donor gives us a gift and it's over $50, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give them a call and we're going to write them a nice email. Excuse me. If a donor gives a gift over $500, we're going to basically um, uh, have someone from our senior team call, or maybe it's a board member call, and we're going to um, invite them to a thank you uh, for the project that you're doing. So that might be, you know, having an expert on talking about climate change, or they get invited to that kind of meeting. So those are the kinds of stewardship. I have 26 different ideas. I have one for every letter of the alphabet. I do a, maybe we could do that someday, Christi, uh, Christina, is share that list. But um, so stewardship and communications are different because your communications plan is going to be, what are we using for social media? What's our key messaging? What surrounds the appeal? Because you can't just always ask, ask, ask. You have to have it as a two-way. So you might start talking about a project that you're wanting to fund then you might do an appeal for it and then you might follow up with it. So your comms plan would include um, what audiences are you talking to? What vehicles are you using? Are you using traditional media? Um, Ecology Ottawa is a great example of an organization that comes on with me a lot. Um, Angela comes on with me and talks about some of the issues that are happening in terms of the Ottawa area. So are you using traditional media or using social media? So your comms plan would look very different than your stewardship plan. Um, and uh, and sometimes the, um, but, but they all need to work together. So you want them to be succinct. So what I mean by that is if you have a fundraising plan and let's just using Giving Tuesday, for instance. Giving Tuesday, usually the Tuesday after the Thanksgiving long weekend. And it's an opportunity to appeal to people to not forget in the commercialization of the giving season, that it's all about philanthropy. So this is an opportunity for um, for people to do a big, um, you know, drive. So your communications plan that day, um, for, or your fundraising plan that day, might be to get fifty new donors. So how are you going to do that? Well, I'm going to do that by um, encouraging our board members to find two donors each. Um, I'm going to put it out on social media. I'm going to have a matching gift maybe have a matching gift for $1,000 or $5,000, whatever it's it's going to be. And then you would have a stewardship plan that the donors that have given to you before, because it's going to be always cheaper, uh, less expensive to find uh, money from a donor that's already given to you than find a new donor. So you go back to your stewardship plan and say, you know, and work your stewardship to see if anybody's going to be able to, to give to you. So you're not only getting new donors for this acquisition, but you're getting cultivated donors as well. And then your communications plan would be on top of it all and having all of these different vehicles supporting and kind of rowing in the same direction. I have a question here as well from Samuel. I have a question about balancing offering perks for members and donors. The perks obviously won't have a nearly equivalent value to the membership or donation. Is there a point where these little perks put donors in the wrong mindset and undermine the fundraising effort? Yes, I'm so glad you asked this. Okay. So there are things called premiums. So a lot of people will, um, and a lot of organizations will mail things like um, greeting cards and address stickers and that type of thing to try and, and get donations. And then sometimes, like for instance, I gave a donation somewhere and then I ended up getting this huge catalog, this annual report. And I thought, I just gave you 50 bucks and now I got this big, giant, glossy magazine. So it can absolutely turn donors off. My favorite kind of stewardship is relationship stewardship. So what I mean by that, whether you're going to send somebody a little postcard, whether you're going to send somebody, um, you know, an article that might interest them. My stewardship is not about sending a lot of money. I'll give you an example. When I used to tour people around, when I worked at the Ottawa Mission, I worked there for close to a decade. Um, and what we used to do is if somebody did a little tour for us, and the kitchen was making, you know, cookies or squares or something, we would send them away with a little, a little bag full of little treats. Well, that wasn't really costing us a lot. It was a nice little touch. It got to showcase the work 
of the students at the Ottawa Mission learning culinary skills as well. So those, the most organic stewardship is the best stewardship. Do not spend a lot of money on stewardship. The resources that you have might be a little bit, but you, you don't need to spend a lot. Hi, Christina. Hello. I just see that Sam is here. Uh, we can actually pull him in. Maybe he has an example or something he wants to add to that question. Yeah, for sure. Sam, go ahead. Hi, Samuel. Hi. I just, I think I want to clarify a little bit. I'm thinking about the, the balance between, um, trying to sell membership or donors or being becoming a donor as like if you become a donor you will get these little perks you know you'll get invited to this you'll get yeah. um, you know this newsletter um and then you know and i know like from listening to podcasts you know they'll offer a t-shirt or something and i think well that's an expensive t-shirt i don't want that yeah. you know so it's whereas they're trying to they're trying to get me to support the podcast so in this case i want people to to be a, um to support the organization and are they going to look at these little membership perks and think, oh, this isn't value for money? Yeah, you know what? You you want donors that are going to want to stay engaged. So, it, you know, if somebody is feeling like, you know, the perk of getting a newsletter um, isn't something that they want, they probably aren't a donor that's going to stay with you for a long time. Typically, you want you want donors that are going to feel engaged and they want those perks of becoming a donor. I agree with you, like anything that, anything like a t-shirt or a statue or anything that's going to be sitting on my desk or that I'm going to be wearing, those are out. Like to me that those days are over. Those don't work anymore. Um, a lot of donors get really upset. Now there's a lot of places that will do it. Like, you know, we'll send you this stuffed animal of a polar bear. If you give a hundred dollars to save the polar bears, that's not what I'm talking about. That, that that's a style of fundraising that is more marketing to me than fundraising. You want donors that are going to align with your values, that they will see the perks of fundraising, whether it be the newsletter or whatever sort of um, perks that you're offering to be, um, you know, to be aligned with their values. And they want to see how the, the work is progressing. So, um, yeah, I don't I wouldn't worry so much about the, you know, the donor benefits, if you will. Um, I would just caution you not to sort of use them as, um, as premiums. Does that yeah. help? Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. So we have an anonymous attendee asking, do you have examples of the plans? There are so many examples. So, um, so do never, okay. I'm going to tell you something right now in fundraising. Um, this is one of the beautiful things about this sector is I like to call it R&D. You're probably thinking research and development. I really mean rob and duplicate. And what I mean by that is that you're not going to, you know, take someone's plan and reproduce it 100% for yourself. But if you Google fundraising plan, stewardship plan, strategic plan, comms plan, case for support, you are going to find, you will be up for years reading all of those. So you do not need to start from scratch. Uh, I would suggest doing a, you know, doing a, a nice sort of first kind of Google and see what you can find there. And, um, and then just don't start with a blank piece of paper because it's be too daunting. And I always say to my clients that don't have all of these, sometimes people have maybe two of them. I'll say, I just want one page for each. Just give me one page. Um, and then that could feel a lot less daunting. And that's where we start. Great question. Uh, Jim, I heard in a meeting on fundraising, donors want their donation. Oh, sorry. I've got two and two from Jim. I heard in a meeting on fundraising. It was a bad idea to provide a financial bonus for donation. Yes, absolutely. Is Jim here? Uh, Hannah's going to work on that, but he, he's also put a clarifying comment. I think okay. in other up. words, donors want their donation to do some good. They don't want a, a financial reward. They want to see impact. Yes. They should never, ever be receiving a financial award, Jim. Yeah, and Jim, you're here now. So if you want to speak, go ahead. Hi, Jim. Well, if you understand it, I think I've said it. But uh, I, I forget who who it was. It might have been Alex a few years ago. Um, it's it's sometimes insulting for somebody to say, well, here, you've given us 100 bucks. We're going to give you um, a coupon to a restaurant or something like that. Yeah, no. The, the philanthropy, philanthropy has no ties except to the heart. Yeah. Yeah. Great question, though. I was thinking about like, 
for some of the groups that there's a lot of great information you shared and something that really struck with me was when you said, you know, don't acquire a donor if you're, if you're not planning on keeping them, or if you're not going to work on the stewardship part. So where should someone, you've given so many great ideas, but can we just go back to a few basics on what are the, what are some really simple steps to get started? If you, if you've been noticing that you've been getting donors and they're just kind of disappearing through the winds, what are the simple things you can do to start that stewardship and cultivation? Oh, brilliant question. So the very first thing you want to do is you want to create And this would be the very first thing you could do in your stewardship plan, your one page stewardship plan. You're going to write at the top of it, welcome. So you're going to have a plan to welcome every new donor. And you can go back, you can go back six months. So you can go back to January of 2023, still consider them new donors. And you're going to reach out to every single one of them. So I would suggest you don't have to do this yourself. Once again, you have a team there. Um, So I would suggest that you um, come up with a plan that every new donor that is given their very first gift is going to be called. You can create a little bit of a um, a script and have everybody called and thank them for joining your XY family. So thank you for joining the Ecology Ottawa family. Thank you for joining the CI, CBAI family. And then um, because I'll tell you that there's a there's a term in fundraising called second gift conversion. And second gift conversion is how many donors actually give you a second gift. It is astonishing how many donors give one gift and never give again. We do not want that. We do not want that. We want all donors to be giving at least a couple of gifts. So it's it's on us. If we want to keep those donors to come up with some sort of welcome. Now, some people will put a little nice little welcome to the family, you know, sort of buck slip uh, if they're mailing back a receipt. They might receive a special email a couple of days after sending that gift as a welcome. Um, You know, they might receive something like that. Um, But it's very uh, important to, to ensure that you've got something like that going. And then, and then what you do is, you know, if somebody gives a second gift and then you can celebrate Um, And this is why having a, even a small donor database, something easy to work with is you can do a report and say every quarter phone, everybody who's made their 10th gift or somebody that's become a monthly donor, you want to thank them. Um, So there's lots of different ideas. You know, I could go on forever, Christina, I'm going to stop, but yeah, those are. And and I just want to reiterate too, because I know some people, when we talk about donors and we've mentioned a few times tax receipts for those people who are nonprofits and not charities, they start to say, well, this isn't for me, but I just really want to emphasize how, you know, the tax receipt isn't as important necessarily anymore. And there are so many nonprofits out there who are bringing in like 30 to $50,000 a month in monthly donors. And it's not about the tax receipt for those individuals. So it's not that it can't be done. And for some people, yes, the tax receipt is really important, but there's so many examples of organizations that are raising money, even without being able to give a tax receipt that I think we really need to make sure we're taking these suggestions into account. Even if you're, you sort of say, well, I'm not, I'm a nonprofit, not a charity, so I can't do this. Yeah. And, and thank you for mentioning that because you still need to do those, those warm, joyful, uh, thank yous back. You still need to, to do all the stewardship. Once again, you know, giving to your organization shouldn't feel like an oil change. Uh, it should feel like a heart change. Um, so you need to, you know, you need to sort of connect on that level for sure. And maybe we'll take a last question here from Lee. I see you can probably see it in the chat there, Sam. Oh, but, sorry. Uh, or I can read it if you'd like. Yeah. Um, for small organizations, what about getting support from local businesses, for example, in-kind donations or any different methods? Different, Or are there any differences in methods? Yes. So, yeah, very much so, actually. I'm just working on a big in-kind uh, project right now, actually, for a client. Um, yeah, this is a great way to, to sort of inter- excuse me, introduce yourself uh, to the business community. And, um, and it can actually save you a lot of money. I mean, if you're looking for, um, I mean, I'm just thinking about something really small, but if you're doing a a walkathon, for instance, and you're looking for 25 cases of, of water, you know, approaching somebody like that, but you can look at bigger ideas too, in terms of gifts in kind, um, gifts of kind of service, gifts of kind um, of, of actual goods in terms of, uh, maybe it's, you know, office furniture or it's something like that. Um, it is different in terms of your approaching and it should still feel like a relationship, not a transaction. Um, but it should feel like an invitation to be part of, 
of what you're doing. I think it's really important that when you approach people that it's not about, how do I phrase this? It's not about everything that you need. It's about creating a community around your organization. It's about how can you be part of this community? We want to invite you in. And I know language is really important here because I think as fundraisers, you know, I was always, I always tell the story. I was a bit shy to introduce myself as a fundraiser for a little bit because the reaction of people would be like, oh, I don't have any money. And oh, I bet you're going to ask me for something. And then I saw Desmond Tutu, Bishop Desmond Tutu speak in Baltimore in 2012 or 13. And he said, you know, fundraising is a noble profession. You're connecting generous people to life-changing work on, you know, neuroscience or it's the climate or it's veterans or it's dogs and cats. It doesn't matter what it is. You're that middle piece and it's a noble profession. And when you invite people to be part of it is a very different feeling than you're asking or you're, you're, you're begging somebody. It's the worst, but you're begging something. If you have to beg, uh, that's probably not the donor for you. Thanks, Sam. As always, there's so much great information packed into today's session. And I just want to um, invite everyone on the call today, if you're kicking yourself for not having a whole bunch of your board members here today listening, don't forget that these recordings go up on our YouTube channel. And you can feel free to share that as a board development opportunity uh, to talk and learn about fundraising, um, because we can continue to use these resources and strengthen the capacity of our board. So again, thanks, Sam, so much for all of your uh, advice. Next month, I'll be passing the baton back to Sam after these fun two months of acting as hostess. Uh, yeah. So Sam will be taking back uh, uh, back her role and, um, and we will be meeting again on August 14th at 4 p.m. So we look forward to seeing everybody there. Don't forget to register in advance and we'll see you next time. Thanks everybody. Wonderful, thanks, bye.